G'day everyone and welcome to the Trexone Spotlight, Matt Miller with you. Joining me today is Dr Tamara Davis from the University of Queensland, you're an astrophysicist. That's right. Thanks for your time today. Thanks so much for chatting with me. Now, Professor Stephen Hawking mm -hmm. was diagnosed with motor neuron disease, given two years to live. Yes. Five decades later, here we are, he's, he's passed away sadly at the age of 76. What does he mean to you? Stephen Hawking was really an inspiration, both as a physicist and as a human being. You can see he overcame enormous personal um, challenges, physical challenges, in order to be able to do the, um, his research, and yet excelled in uh, so many ways. I remember Stephen Hawking from being, uh, when reading The Brief History of Time as a teenager, and being absolutely dumbfounded by the fact that physics was explaining questions that previously had only been the domain of philosophy and religion, like how did the universe begin? And when I realised that you could actually go and ask physics quantitative questions and, and figure out how in quantum physics you might have been able to create a universe, mm. that was a revelation to me. And I, it's probably one of the initial sparks that inspired my real profound interest in cosmology and is where I am today. My tweet yesterday said that he shaped our lives. He really did that, didn't he? Yeah, I think he was fantastic in that he communicated his research as well. He was not satisfied with just discovering profound things about the universe. He wanted to share that knowledge with everybody. And that's, it's, that desire is quite common. The skill to do it is really difficult, but he did it really well. And I love A Brief History of Time, his book, uh, the first book there, in that it didn't shy away from asking really difficult questions about us and trying to explain the details. Uh, he was didn't give you just the cartoon version mm. of the physics. He actually said, no, check this out. I've got imaginary time. Like, you know, we've got square roots of negative one in here. And how does that work? And if time goes this way? And trying to explain the depth of complexity in a way that uh, a lay reader could understand. I know a lot of people walked away from that book without fully comprehending uh, what was going on, but I think everyone went away with a sense of wonder. What were some of his key discoveries? So Hawking's most famous for the, his studies of black holes. And we know that black holes are so dense that light can't escape their gravitational pull, right? But Hawking discovered that black holes should actually glow. Uh, now, this light that's emitted from around black holes is now known as Hawking radiation. And it seems to sort of contradict everything we thought we knew about black holes, but it doesn't. <laughs> and the way that that works is that the black holes, you have the event horizon. If you go closer to the black hole than the event horizon, that's the point of no return. You can never escape, no light that you emit will ever get out. Very bad for your health, don't do that. Um, but. Uh, the Hawking radiation isn't being emitted from inside. Nothing emerges from the event horizon. It's actually created by effects in the quantum vacuum just outside the event horizon. Uh, and it, because it starts from outside, that's not violating any of the um, quantum rules or the rules of the black holes. But interestingly, you can't create something from nothing. So if light is, and particles are being created outside of the black hole, where is the energy coming from? And to make that happen, the black hole has to pay. And it pays with the only currency it has, its mass. So as it glows, that takes energy away from the black hole and reduces its mass. And so the black hole slowly shrinks. It's known as black hole evaporation. And it goes all the way to the point where the black hole disappears in a blinding flash of light uh, and is no more. How does someone on Earth discover that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, interestingly, the, when the people who are famous for uh, uh, inventing the, some of the code that became Wi-Fi, which is some Australian astronomers working at the Parkes Radio Telescope, um, were actually looking for this Hawking radiation flashes from uh, evaporating black holes. They never found that, but in the process of trying to process radio signals quickly, they figured out how to do Wi-Fi. So that was, <laughs> you know, one of the side benefits in which why Hawking indirectly <laughs> changed our lives. Um, and admittedly, we haven't seen Hawking radiation. So we can't uh, experimentally confirm that it's there, but it's been theoretically confirmed in a wide variety of different ways, different types of derivations that is very, that we're pretty confident that it's there. So that's uh, sort of really exciting. And the reason that it's so exciting is because 
Hawking was taking seriously, really, the idea of what happens when you deal with quantum physics in the vicinity of a black hole in strongly curved space. And that was the sort of uh, a trailblazing effort by him, which explained things that no one had ever seen before. And the same theory that, uh, ex that he was using to explain that translates into really implica interesting implications about the universe as a whole. For example, it gives you ideas about how you could create a universe from the quantum vacuum, from essentially nothing to start with. And the big quest in modern physics really is to try and figure out a quantum theory of gravity. We have these two fantastically successful theories. Quantum physics does great with particles, every, all the little nitty gritty stuff. Um, general relativity does a fantastic job of gravity. Uh, and you actually, we can te we've tested both of those in a huge number of ways. Just one quick example is our GPSs on our phones wouldn't work if we didn't take into account general relativity. So it's become part of our everyday life. But the two theories are fundamentally incompatible. We know that they don't work together. And that has perplexed physicists for a century. And we're trying to figure that out. So by delving into that area, that's one of the ways in which Stephen Hawking has really advanced our understanding. We haven't got to a final answer yet, but we're sort of, he laid the foundation for a whole new type of study that is occupying us physicists these days. Do you think we'd ever, we'll ever get to a final answer uh, in all of this? Would that just make it boring? I th the final answer is not with us yet. Who knows whether we're going to be able to get there. Is it 42? <laughs> yeah, the answer could be 42. <laughs> but then what's the question? <laughs> yeah. The, um, but the quest for a theory of everything, that's the one of the things that uh, people have been looking for. And the... Uh, so Stephen Hawking had a really good quote about this, which I'll try and remember. It went along the lines of, you know, if we understand a theory of everything, it will be the ultimate triumph for human reason. And concluded that with, it would be like um, knowing the mind of God, paraphrasing someone. And he had to explain that question many times, or that statement many times, because He's, as a devout atheist, he was clear, wanted to be clear that, no, 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 I'm not talking about we're actually going to see a deity or understand a deity. He's explaining that with the physics that is we're using here, you can show how you can create a universe and how everything within that universe evolves naturally without the need for a deity. So it would be like understanding the rules that were laid down um, by physics that, that made our universe. And that would be sort of like seeing uh, the mind of a god. Yeah. So Stephen has really left physicists around the world with plenty to keep them occupied and, until the next great mind comes along, hasn't he? Yeah, and I think the idea of like the next great mind is perhaps a little bit uh, overblown because there's some really famous people. You've got the Einsteins, you've got the Stephen Hawkings, the people that uh, get, become really recognisable figures. But a lot of this research is not done in isolation. Hawking collaborated on most of his papers and you chip away with little bits of knowledge, lots and lots of different people contributing new ideas, building on the old, sometimes breaking down the old when we realise we've made a mistake and building up higher in a different direction. And it's a real communal effort and the number of physicists working on these kinds of questions is now huge and we're building on the foundation that was left by Stephen Hawking and many of his contemporaries and those that came before.